Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of uh, 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item, I remind everybody they shouldn't have mobile phones on. Uh, members of the committee do use tablets for the business of the day. Um, agenda item one, a decision on taking items in private, and this is to consider the work programme we come to in private at the next meeting of the committee. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item two, subordinate legislation. Second item on the agenda uh, is about consideration of the draft Scottish Marine Regions Order 2015. The instrument has been laid under the affirmative procedure, which means that Parliament must approve it before the provisions may come into force. Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited to consider the motion to approve the instrument under agenda item three. I welcome uh, Richard Lockhead, our Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Food and Environment. Good morning. And uh, your supporting staff, David Palmer, Ian Vickerstaff and David Tullett. Uh, do you wish to speak to the instrument, Richard? I do, Convener. Uh, thank you very much and good morning to the committee. And I have colleagues with me because of some of the technical aspects of the, the order before us and some unusual phrases you may find uh, so that's why I have a number of colleagues with me this morning. So I'd just like to say a few opening remarks. Uh, because, as you know, recently we adopted Scotland's first ever national marine plan. And the next step, which is to take forward regional planning as part of that, allows local ownership and decision making about specific issues out to 12 nautical miles. Now, the draft order designates 11 Scottish marine regions and identifies their boundaries. This needs to happen so that regional marine planning can then be delegated to the bodies which are to form the marine planning partnerships. The draft order has taken time to finalise due to two rounds of consultations and the complexities of establishing marine boundaries via the use of coordinates and how these are joined up. All Scottish marine regions must be part of the Scottish marine area and that of course is defined in the Marine Act of 2010. The Scottish Marine Area is bounded by the mean high water spring tides of Scotland, the boundaries provided by the Scottish Adjacent Waters Boundary Order of 1999, and the seaward limit of the Territorial Sea, which is commonly referred to as a 12 nautical mile limit. The 1999 order is a UK order made under the Scotland Act that draws boundaries to determine which areas of the UK internal waters and Territorial Sea are, for the purposes of that Act, defined as part of Scotland. However, recent mapping shows that the boundaries under that order do not actually extend to the mean high water spring tide at the border between Scotland and England. On the east coast, the boundary extends to mean low water spring tide. But on the west coast, the first coordinate under the 99 order is now some distance from the Scotland-England border, where it runs through the middle of the River Esk and the mouth of the, the River Sark. The distance between these points is now about 200 metres, this was not the case at the time of the 1990 order when it was made. So effectively we have uh, a 200 metre gap in the Scottish-English border. I have recently written to Elizabeth Truss, the Secretary of State, for a review of the 1999 order for two reasons. Firstly, to address the inconsistency of some 6,000 square miles between the North Sea boundary between Scotland, England and the East Coast under the 1999 order, which of course has been debated uh, by this Parliament in the early days. And on the East Coast, uh, under the 99 order, and the, the, the boundary that was established under the 99 order, and the previous uh, boundary that was established under the Civil Jurisdiction Offshore Activities Order of 1987. And the committee may remember Parliament, on several occasions in the past, has debated the difference between these two boundaries. The second reason I've written to the Secretary of State is to address a technical issue in relation to the boundary in the West Coast that is due to a change in the course of the River Esk which I've just referred to as a result of natural processes since the 1999 order uh, was made. This issue in the West Coast was also recognised by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in their recent consideration of the order that we are discussing today. However, it's, it's, it's important to note that the committee didn't raise any legal issues with this order. The extent of the Solway and the Fourth and Tay Scottish Marine regions in these two areas is that of the Scottish Marine area as provided by the Marine Act Scotland. It is not for the Scottish Marine Regions Order we're discussing today to determine the boundaries in these areas. That has to be achieved by amending the 99 Order. <coughs> Article 1 of the draft Scottish Marines Regional Order sets out the details on the coordinates system and lines used in determining these boundaries. The coordinates are expressed in terms of latitude and longitude. 
using the same projection as the 99 order. In the remaining articles of the draft order, the regions themselves and the boundaries of the regions are described in a clockwise rotation starting from the Solway and working around the coast of Scotland and ending at the 4th and Tay region. The order is essential in establishing the 11 marine regions so the delegation of regional marine planning functions to marine planning partnerships will be possible and statutory regional marine plans can then be prepared and adopted. It will take some time to set up the marine planning partnerships and develop marine plans for all 11 regions and this will be an evolving process taken forward in phases. Clyde and Shetland will be the first marine planning partnerships and they can only be created, of course, after marine regions are established by this order. I hope that gives some backgrounds. I've hope, tried not to make it too technical, but I'm happy to take any questions the committee have on the various issues I've raised in the order before you. The name of that rock. Yeah. Um, members have uh, questions just now about this. Um, anyone want to kick off? Um, I'll, I'll start off with a question. Um, the setting out of these boundaries is to, as a, part of a process with regards to the way in which um, these areas will be administered. Um, what discussions have you had with the uh, bodies which uh, are going to be administering these, uh, that they have the competencies, the skills to be able to manage these areas? It's something which obviously follows from this, but the marine uh, borders that you've set up you know, are uh, novel. Uh, I understand the uh, onshore aspect, but obviously there might be some uh, questions about the uh, placing of the boundaries between islands and the mainland and so on. Uh, thank you. Well, firstly, <coughs> it's worth pointing out there's been two rounds of consultations in previous years. The first round of consultations was on the concept of regional planning as part of the Marine Act and establishing marine regions. Uh, the second round of consultations was on what the actual region should be and how many there should be and what they should look like. And we've arrived at the conclusion that there should be 11 in Scotland and that's broadly been agreed by the stakeholders and, and people who responded to the, the consultations. In terms of expertise, <coughs> clearly that is an issue and I don't deny that's an issue, but as I just said in my opening remarks, this is a phased approach to establishing the actual marine planning partnerships that will do the work. And for that reason, the first two we will establish are Clyde and Shetland, where there's existing expertise, and they are on board for blazing the trail and, and being the first in the vanguard. So we're confident the expertise is in these two regions, so two out of the 11 will get underway hopefully in 2015, uh, once we go through the various processes, depending on the committee's uh, view of, of today's order. And we will continue to work, as I gave commitments to the committee before, when we're discussing the National Marine Plan for Scotland with the other local uh, areas and local authorities and other bodies that have a role to play in this to make sure we can build up uh, the expertise. But clearly that's a role that Marine Scotland are taking on and taking seriously. But I notice, for example, in terms of boundaries that um, there's uh, some offshore islets um, on the north coast of Scotland which have been associated with uh, Orkney rather than the nearer coast, which is the north coast of my constituency um, and the north coast uh, marine area. Uh, I just wondered why that kind of arrangement had been made. I can understand the other ones that are associated with the Western Isles, but I'm surprised at that one being uh, joined to Orkney. I'll ask David Palmer to come in, who's clearly involved in the detail of uh, discussions with local authorities and other agencies, but they've emerged from the consultation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, effectively, uh, our understanding is those islands are actually part of Orkney, um, and that's why we've included them in that region. I see. The member believes that um, his constituency includes those islands. <laughs> How very interesting. <laughs> I, I wonder I'm not sure if you're having a land grab uh, in uh, Caithness and Sutherland, but maybe uh, I won't well, interfere too much. <laughs> well, there we go. I mean, I just wondered whether they are part of the local government area that includes Orkney. Um, I guess that would be... That, that's my understanding of it, yeah. Okay. Well, that's something which I would like an answer on, if at all possible, so we can just sort that little matter out. Um, the constituency casework to the local member for Orkney. We most certainly will. Uh, I suspect that it's uh, merely, uh, since nobody lives there, um, something <laughs> which will, will allow uh, some planning for the area as a reef for uh, fishing development and so on. But that's fine. Yes. Well, first of all, Claudia Beamish, and then... Uh, Good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and... Uh, um, uh, Scottish Government colleagues. Um, could I uh, 
press you a little further on the, the convener's question about uh, the resource implications and ask you if either Scottish Government itself or Marine Scotland has set aside additional funds in any way to support um, the, the implications of the rollout. Because while I take your point about the two pilot um, areas having expertise um, and accept that in, obviously in good faith, um, I do have concerns about the lack of knowledge in, in some local authorities and in some of the um, state, with some of the stakeholders and have concerns about um, support and training implications. So could you highlight in any detail um, any additional funding that's going towards that? <clears throat> There's not a specific fund within Marine Scotland dedicated to that. However, the Marine Scotland budget is being used to take forward everything that's flowing out of the Marine Act, mm -hmm. and that includes in the past and no doubt in the future events and anything needs to be done to make sure that we can work with the local authorities, local agencies, to make sure the appropriate change is put in place. So whilst I can't give you particular budget headings for that, I can just assure you that the Marine Scotland budget is being used in a general sense to take forward anything that needs to be done. It's an evolving process, so it's difficult to sit here today and say exactly what will have to be done to get us where we want to get to by any particular time, because there's no set target dates for establishing the living marine regions. We're focusing on the two at the moment, who, who are very keen and enthusiastic about getting established and moving forward, and have the expertise. Across the other nine regions, there's various levels of expertise, and as you know, in different parts of our, our marine area, there's different levels of, acti of activity at the moment. So where there's a history of aquaculture, for instance, in some local authority areas, they will have a certain level of expertise. Other regions of, of Scotland have very little marine activity. So therefore, they may be some years down the line before they get established. Uh, so it's an evolving process. But we are uh, in constant contact with the potential partners in the marine partnerships to make sure we, we understand their needs. Right, thank you. And uh, through the convener, just for the record, um, having taken some local soundings from um, local councillor and, and others in, in the Solway area, um, I'm, I just would like it on the record that um, I'm content with the, the changes <coughs> to the boundaries, without going into any more detail. <coughs> yeah, well, that's good. And I just have to say to the committee that we, we turn to the Treaty of York from 1237, signed by Alexander II of Scotland, a very good King of Scotland, and also Henry III of England, who helpfully signed that treaty to establish the, the borders between Scotland and England, and we had to turn to that as we were establishing <laughs> what to do in Solway. M Mr Russell, perhaps, has a point on this. Yeah. Except yeah. the treaty didn't establish that, did it? Um, <laughs> a, because it was subject to very considerable um, revision later on. Serious point, though, how do you resolve this issue? I mean, the, the issue of the boundary between Scotland and England may not seem that serious on, on this matter, but it is serious in terms of where the, the law and, and, and planning will apply. And uh, there is, doesn't seem to be a proposal for you about how you would resolve this. So how will you resolve it? You are speaking to the UK government. What's the basis of the resolution you're seeking? <clears throat> well, clearly, in terms of the Scotland Act, the Scotland established the... Scottish Adjacent Waters Boundary Order of 1999, uh, and therefore, as this Parliament uh, is uh, bound to the Scotland Act, we have to use that as our, our, our determining our boundaries. The 99 order, in terms of the Solway, for instance, uh, clearly went used as the end point, the, the midpoint of the two rivers, the Sark and the Esk, but that moves and I'm not sure if the committee has access to the maps, but even looking at the maps over the last 10 or 15 years, you can compare to where the midpoint was between these two rivers, and they've moved substantially. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the 1999 order does not account for that, and as a result, a 200-metre gap has appeared. Yeah, <laughs> so what we're asking for is for the 1999 order to be revised to take that into account, and it should give a geographical description within the order, as in wherever the midpoint may be is the, where the, the, the boundary joins up. And clear that would then account for any future movement of the of the midpoint between the two rivers. In terms of the east coast, clearly, uh, if I recall correctly, one of the first debates this Parliament had in 1999, and indeed the first debate I spoke in, yeah. it was in relation to the order put forward in 99 for devolution, where 
the civil jurisdiction order of 1987 was ignored and a new boundary was established that effectively removed 6,000 square miles of waters from Scottish jurisdiction. And clearly, there have been various attempts since then to persuade various UK governments to revisit the 99 order. That's not happened. Because of this new issue, however minor it may be, we're using that opportunity again to ask for a revision of the 99 order. So if I can be absolutely clear, on the East Coast, the proposal is to revert to the 1987 order. And on the West Coast, the proposal is to set uh, GPS coordinates of where that line would have been and was in 1999 and to hold those as the fixed points rather than to allow a moving point, which is the midpoint, which has changed. So you'll have GPS coordinates based on where that fixed point was in 1999 and that will be where you want the official boundary to be drawn. Is that correct? Effectively, yes. But bringing colleagues here who are the experts on establishing the coordinates, I don't know who would want to come in. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that is correct, uh, because my understanding is that you are wanting a geographical description rather than a coordinate. The problem has arisen because a coordinate has been specified, and uh, the midpoint of the river has since mo moved away from that coordinate. But if you have a GPS coordinate that says that's where the boundary is, um, then that's fixed for all time, is it not? It, it would be if that was what was chosen. Okay, so it would be better to have, surely, a fixed decision on this rather than one that could change again. Well, we're, what we're looking at here is the interaction between the marine boundary and effectively the existing Scotland-England boundary. There's an interaction between these two boundaries. Well, and so that is an option, what you're saying, potentially. But what we're saying is because, at the moment, the point that is used shifts <coughs> over time, and the 99 order doesn't account for that, we've left with a gap, mm -hmm. which we have included within the marine order here. So we're closing that gap. But in terms of revising the 99 order, mm -hmm. we have to find a way, through negotiation, of making sure that, <laughs> should the sands shift in the future, it doesn't leave a gap between the Scotland and England boundary which would imply that you need a fixed point. No. Yeah. Well, it depends how you define... Sorry, Mr. Mr. Ferguson and I will now debate this issue amongst ourselves. Yeah. But that's, that, yeah, so yeah. on this point, uh, Sarah Boyer... <laughs> you, but not okay, we'll exactly come back this to one will come back to me, I sure. think. So, Mr. Ferguson... Sorry, sorry but I, I picked up from the Cabinet Secretary's uh, earlier remarks that the intention was to find a solution that took account of a shifting boundary in future. Uh, a, a fixed point, as Mr. Russell has been intimating, surely wouldn't have that effect. Can I just, just to clarify exactly what you're thinking here? Well, our thinking is that it would make sense to have a geographical description. So there's two boundaries hitting each other here. One is the marine boundary and one is the existing Scotland-England boundary. And therefore, because the marine boundary has been established by the 99 order and because the other boundary is established by the midpoint between two rivers... Where the coordinate finished for the 99 order to meet the previous middle point of the two rivers, then that coordinate becomes defunct because the, the middle point of the two rivers has shifted because the sands have shifted, leaving a gap. So it seemed to us the easiest way, in terms of, it's still a fixed point, but the fixed point would be wherever the middle point happens to be of the two rivers. That will not be a fixed point the, from the GPS point of view, will it? Not from the 99 order, no. We may, may be making heavy work on this, but it does seem to be a, a fairly important point. The setting of a boundary as being the fixed point, the midpoint of two rivers, is perfectly understandable when you thought the rivers didn't move very much and you, know, you, sat, you stood there and looked out with your spyglass and said that's where it's to be. Uh, if we have the capability of setting this by using uh, satellite technology, surely it would be best simply to have the line defined by exactly where we believe this boundary to be and to have been, and that will be the end of the matter. Otherwise, we're going to come back to this in a few years' time. Well, clearly we're asking for a revision of the 99 order. There's two issues, the East Coast plus is this issue in the Solway, and who knows where the negotiation will go with the UK government, but we're not proposing to reopen the Treaty of York from 1237 that establishes the, the common law border between Scotland and England, uh, which is one of the borders in terms of two boundaries we're discussing here. One is the Scotland England border, the other one is the marine boundary coming in from the water. And the point I'm simply making is the marine order from 99, fixed the point where the previous 
midpoint of the two rivers was, but that's now shifted. Therefore, that coordinate has left a gap of 200 metres. So now we know that as Sark runs out of the Solway sands, that these are shifting sands, and uh, somehow or other we've got to pin this down. Um, as if only Burns Alexander said. II and Henry III had thought about their own <laughs> Scottish adjacent waters boundary order, they would have had to sort it. <laughs> Say boy. Uh, convener, I also have a, a boundaries and borders question. Um, and it's, it's not about lines on map, per se, um, and this discussion has actually kind of flushed out the fact that, we're, that we have to think about time, space and depth. And in the marine environment, it is not as easy as lines on maps and negotiations. And my boundaries question is less a national question, because um, that, that's been a very good debate we've just had. It's actually about the regional boundaries. And I say that having watched regional boundaries on maps between planning authorities. And I think in the, the marine context, the cross-boundary discussions between those in charge of the different regional areas will become more important. And it's as much to flag an issue for the future. I think the fact that you're selecting Shetland and Clyde as our two starter points is very intelligent, but it does beg questions about boundaries between Clyde, North and South. Um, the, the, the convener's first questions about the islands off the north of Scotland and, Kirk, and Orkney are, are quite interesting. But you look round the, the map, there will be cross-boundary issues. And I think it just needs to be factored in for the future. It's not about where the boundaries lie. It's more about activities and species that will cross boundaries and will not remain in the regional area. So it's to factor some kind of protocols or some kind of discussions between those responsible for the different marine activities within those boundaries that this is not going to be a, a big issue at the start I think but it's something you need to think through about how the different organisations in the different areas will be required to relate to each other over time and to have those regular discussions It's a very fair point from Sarah Boyack and clearly as this process evolves and more regions are established their intention would be to make sure they're working closely together Yeah I mean, in at the UK level as well, but I think my concern was primarily inter-region within Scotland. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're talking about two or three areas where there are several local authorities, like uh, the Tay and the Forth area, whatever that's called, um, and uh, also the one between Highland, Murray, and, Aberde and Aberdeenshire, yeah, um, in the, the Murray Firth. So, you know, there will be a need for that kind of coordination. But anyway, the boundaries are, have been proposed. Um, are there any further questions with regard to this? Um, in which case, if not, then we'll move to agenda item three, which allows for the motion 12904, asking the committee to recommend approval of the affirmative instrument Scottish Marine Regions Order 2015 draft. And um, the motion can be debated for as long as you like, but at least up to 90 minutes. But uh, hopefully it won't. 1,237 minutes even are out of the question. So um, we will therefore uh, start in the formal process now with the Cabinet Secretary speaking to and moving the motion. Uh, thank you. Although I am tempted to use the 90 minutes to continue my debate with Michael Russell over how to establish the Scotland-England border, I will, <laughs> I will forego that opportunity and just thank the committee for their questions and just simply to reiterate that we're very keen for regional marine planning to be bottom-up and for local decision-making to be built into the process as much as possible, albeit within the context of the National Marine Plan that's been adopted. And therefore, uh, I... This is clearly an important point of establishing the boundaries of the marine regions to allow us to then establish the marine planning partnerships and then allow that process to kick off in the future. So I thank the committee for their time. And I formally move the motion. Thank you. I'd just like to say that there's clearly urgent issues in many places that uh, the marine partnerships need to be set up and active. And it's clear to me in areas that I represent that uh, we have um, incursions by uh, a prone if a scallop dredging and things like that, which is already agitating many people who want to see this process moving quickly. And we wish you every success in getting uh, the authorities, especially where there are several which have to work together to do so uh, speedily. Does anyone else wish to ask any points? And if not, then 
Um, does the Cabinet Secretary wish to wind up? And Thank the Committee for the cooperation. Thank you. I uh, put the question then to the Committee members. The question is that Motion S4M 12904 in the name of Richard Lockhead be approved. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. So I thank Richard Lockhead and his officials and we will convey this information and we will now have a short suspension. Thank you.
We'll, we'll make a start again. So the, the fourth item today on the agenda is to take oral evidence on the Scottish Government's consultation on mandatory public uh, sector climate reporting. And we're joined by a panel of stakeholders, and I welcome everyone to the meeting. Just for the benefit of you all, um, the sound is controlled automatically. You don't have to press buttons or anything like that. You will be uh, brought in as I see fit. So just indicate by raising your hand. Uh, you don't need to shout out or anything like that. I'm sure that you'll all be just dying to contribute to what we have to say. Um, I'll go round the room, starting off with um, Bruce Kylo. Just say who you are, what you're representing, and then we'll identify people around the room just now. OK, thanks. Thanks so, very much, uh, convener, and uh, thanks to the committee for having us here today. I'm Bruce Kylo, Head of Policy and Planning at Strathclyde Partnership for Transport, the Regional Transport Partnership for the West of Scotland. Thank you. Yep. Sarah Boyack, Labour List member for Lothians. Neil Kitching, uh, working the strategy team in Scottish Enterprise. Uh, Dave Thompson, MSB for Scala Caber and Barnoch. Grant Bergson from Edinburgh Napier University. Claudia Beamish, uh, South Scotland and Shadow Minister for Environment and Climate Change. And Jenny Neville from the Scottish Ambulance Service. Mike Russell, MSB for Argana Butte and abnormally obsessed with the Treaty of York. <laughs> Uh, I'm David Seath from Police Scotland. Chris Wood G, um, Sustainable Scotland Network. Uh, the late Alex Ferguson, for which I apologise, um, MSP for Galloway and West Dumfries. I'm Julie Robertson uh, from Sustainable Glasgow in Glasgow City Council. Uh, Jim Hume, MSP for South Scotland. I'm Rebecca Bell, Sustainability Officer at Clackmannanshire Council. Uh, Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. Uh, Neil Deasley, I'm Sustainability Manager with the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. Uh, Graham Day, MSP for Angus South. And I'm Rob Gibson, I'm the convener of this uh, committee, but also the MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. So we're going to kick off uh, some questions, and uh, it doesn't need everybody to answer uh, if they don't feel the need to, but uh, just indicate, as I said, um, Graham Day is going to ask the first question. Uh, Thank you, Kavir, and good morning to the witnesses. I, I'd just like to ask uh, those present what their experiences are of the current approaches to climate change reporting and where they feel it could be improved. So, anyone want to raise their hand and start us off? Yes, Chris. Um, in local authorities, we have been doing the Scottish Climate Change Declaration reporting for the last six, seven years. Um, that's very much what the, the, the new mandatory reporting has been based on. Um, I think we found it useful. Um, it gives us a ties in things like the carbon reduction commitment figures, um, what we find out through our sort of energy billing systems, etc., and an opportunity to look at what's happening across the wider region. So I think it's been a really useful process to actually try and quantify what we're doing. There have been lots of interesting challenges in terms of data accuracy, etc. Um, but the process has evolved, and we have a, at the moment the last year was a relatively stable um, format to report to. Uh, Neil Beasley. Um, yeah, just to give a perspective from 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 SEPA, uh, we've we've been uh, reporting voluntarily actually for for some considerable time, and over that time. Um, our process has evolved considerably and we've, we've got better at it. Um, we've got more efficient at, at it as well. Um, but um, what it does do is, is help us to really understand where we need to prioritise our efforts, our focus and some of our resources into um, reducing uh, our, our own emissions. So it helps us to pinpoint where um, where we can target our effort. And, and a good example of that is being able to understand, uh, for example, uh, our transport and travel emissions. Um, and from that, we're able then to target particular sectors of those emissions or particular um, parts of the organisation um, so that we can drive down um, those emissions and also drive down the associated costs as well. So for us, though, that kind of 16-year period that we've been reporting has been very helpful. I, I'd absolutely agree that there are lots of challenges, particularly around getting the right data in the right format so that you can understand it and, and, and use it. Um, uh, but it's nevertheless uh, proven to be very helpful for us. So that's a point we want to develop uh, as we go on. Yes, Graham. I, I, I guess the sort of subtext to this is how seriously do you all take uh, climate change reporting? Uh, yes, uh, Grant Ferguson. 
you say, to certainly our university, we there's the, the national mandatory reporting universities um, do every year in terms of scope one, two and three. But internally as well, we have our own targets, carbon management plans. I think the, the sector certainly takes it seriously. Um, it's in our um, university strategy that sustainable, um, ethical um, environments that should be supported and, and driven. And we, we believe that having that outside view on where others are is very important to learn from others. So in terms of your question, it's very, very important to us. Jenny Neville. Yes, I certainly think the ambulance service um, takes it seriously. Um, it is quite challenging at the moment to, to try and um, collate all the data as um, has already been suggested. Um, and I think we probably recognise that we have a bit of a way to go, um, certainly to achieve what's um, proposed in the um, papers. Okay, Bruce. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, I, I agree with what everybody said. Um, from our point of view, it's very simple. Um, it is about reducing our emissions, ensuring that we're reducing, reducing our carbon output, but it's also about saving money and getting that message across. And I think that's something that we've most certainly tried to do. Uh, the chap across, Chris, mentioned uh, the carbon reduction commitment. That, to me, is a, a classic example of something where you can put a monetary amount on um, your, your, your carbon output <laughs> and the efforts that an organisation makes to try and reduce that will... Um, reduce the cost of that organisation. So it's actually very simple. And similarly, within SPT, we've got our carbon management plan. We've got our target. Um, a lot of initiatives that we are taking at the moment to do with uh, ground source heat pumps. Uh, we're working with the uh, Glasgow Caledonian University on using the, the excess water which comes out of our subway system, what we can do with that. Uh, various other initiatives which we're trying to take forward. So I think that from the, the, the RTPs, Regional Transport Partnerships, point of view from our organisation like ourselves, we do take it very seriously for those very basic reasons. Um, Julie Robertson, yeah. Uh, so Glasgow City Council again find it um, a very useful and important tool for awareness raising within the organisation. Um, obviously it's taken very seriously and um, we have to go through a variety of sort of frameworks and committee approval um, to actually sign off the process so it really gets that awareness at the very highest level. Um, in particular most recently, um, the, the most recent uh, reporting declaration um, had a lot more questions around climate adaptation, and I definitely feel that was much um, more helpful for us to try and raise the awareness of adaptation, climate mitigation, well covered adaptation. It helps kind of push that agenda much further forward. David Seath. Uh, is a relatively new organisation. Uh, we're still uh, pulling together a lot of this restructuring that's still to be done. Uh, nevertheless, we have introduced the carbon management plan. We have got some experience in the past of voluntary reporting, so it's not completely new to us. Uh, but coming from 10 separate organisations, uh, it's difficult at the moment to get a standard across the country. But that's one of our intentions to make sure that we are consistent throughout uh, the whole of Scotland. Um, we don't have any reservations about the need to do it. We're signed up to do it right up to executive level within the organisation and within the authority itself. All consider it to be of critical importance. Graham Day. Uh, thank you. Can I just be clear on that, Mr C? In terms of Police Scotland, does that carbon management plan take account of the impact of operational changes? To give you an example, in the area that I represent, uh, we've seen... CID, um, garage and uh, um, traffic police relocated to Dundee, away from Angus, which obviously has either a positive or negative carbon in impact. We also see officers moved about all over the division, and that will be common to many parts of Scotland. Is that taken into account when you measure your carbon impact? Uh, absolutely. We're measuring all dimensions uh, of it. It's not just what's done uh, in the premises. It's how we move about the country, how we police the country, and we measure everything it's possible to measure. Uh, we're perhaps struggling a little bit in scope three uh, areas, but certainly scopes one and two don't have an issue uh, with at all. Uh, it's part of our ongoing strategy to rationalise a lot of the things that we do to get the benefits off the 10 organisations coming together. Uh, so that is factored into uh, our calculations. What, when were the baseline figures for this established for the measurement? At what point? Uh, last year, last, last financial year. 
Right. That was the baseline we took because that was our first year coming into. So when will we start to see figures that we can look at on, on you know, the progress that you're making? Well, in the, in the pilot year, we will report uh, on the previous year to see how we've got on in comparison with the targets we've set. Uh, like most organisations, we've got we will meet uh, the requirements uh, by 2020, and we've got a plan to get to 2020, and what each year will we need to do to do that. So we will be sometime this year be able to report back on last year, which was our, uh, what, sorry, the baseline was the year before. Uh, we'll report on last year uh, as our first. Mayor, uh, and just to be clear, will that be broken down to divisional level, or will it just be the national picture? We're only holding information at national level at the moment, but I'm quite sure we could provide uh, regional uh, variations, if so, asked. Thank you. That would be useful. Um, so uh, bring in Rebecca Bell now, Clap Manager. Um, I just wanted to back up. My colleague from Glasgow said that Clap Manager Council also takes its climate change reporting very seriously. Um, I've been compiling the reports for the last six or seven years now, so there's been six reports in total. Uh, they go through our committee process before they're submitted. Uh, we also have a carbon management plan, like most of the other uh, public bodies here, and we have a sustainability and climate change strategy, which is our way to try and address the public body's duties. It's easier in a smaller council than it is, for example, in Glasgow, you know, to, to draw these things together. I think it's possibly easier in terms of the staff that you need to speak to and there only ever being one person that you need to talk to to get the information from. But I imagine in terms of the way the data is gathered through billing, through um, water bills, that kind of thing, I imagine that's probably about the same kind of system. So there's probably not much difference in that sense. Yeah, Julie. Yeah. I think it's fair to say um, we've obviously been reporting since 2008 now, um, so we've come to a point where we do have a fairly um, yeah, kind of set structure in terms of gathering the data, um, but it can be a bit difficult to go through the, the, the sheer number of people, but we're pretty much there, so on par. Do you want to say something, Neil Kitchen? Uh, yes, uh, Scottish Enterprise, we already report our carbon emissions and we have a carbon reduction target to 2020. Uh, what I would say is that the introduction of mandatory reporting will increase consistency across um, the public sector. And I think more importantly, it will increase awareness and profile of this. It's very easy to set up a carbon plan, set up carbon reporting, and over time the interest in it can fade away. But I think with mandatory reporting, that's going to push it right back up into the top management managers and leaders. Do you want to take that up just now, Claudia Beamish? Yeah. No. Um, and good morning to the <coughs> panel. Um, I represent this committee on the Public Sector Climate Leaders Forum and have followed with interest. I, I represent um, the committee as an observer, although I'm allowed to speak occasionally. Um, and, and I followed with interest the developments towards the position that the Scottish Government now has on the consultation, um, which uh, I, I would like, therefore, to pose a question about and to seek views from the panel today on uh, what their view is of the proposals to introduce mandatory reporting specifically. Who's going to go first on that? Oh, dying to have mandatory reporting. Well, Neil and yeah. then uh, Rebecca. Yeah. Um, well, well, our position is uh, very clear. We, we're very supportive um, of, of the proposal um, and, and the elements within the proposal. Um, we have, um, through, through our own involvement in the Climate Leaders Forum and through the, the officers group that supports that, we've, we've been active in, in working with other partners to, um, to help develop um, the, the, the proposal itself. Um, so we're very supportive. Um, we think it's uh, a logical, for us, it's very much a logical next step from 16 years of voluntarily reporting to, to a process where we're moving towards um, uh, more consistent uh, uh, mandatory reporting. Um, so, so we're yeah, absolutely supportive of the process, and, and we will actively uh, participate in the pilot trial of, of, the, of the proposal this, for this current reporting year that we're in. So, so absolutely. Okay, right, Rebecca Bell. Um, we're also supportive of uh, the concept of mandatory reporting, both because I think it's likely to prompt more climate change activity in the organisations, and also because it's a way of recognising and celebrating the progress that those organisations have made and a way of identifying um, where there's areas of weakness and tailoring support to those. I would add that reporting is probably going to require additional time and resources, but I think in the long term that will lead to improvements in the way that we handle climate change. And my final point would be that um, I think analysing the reports is probably the most important thing, ensuring that they're 
that we're reporting for a purpose, and that purpose is to improve the way we tackle climate change. There are interrelated questions here, and I'll just throw this one in, I think, uh, you know, to this. As we're talking about mandatory reporting and reporting as, in general, um, R Rebecca raised the interesting point that the discussions um, probably raised, you know, the, the ideas about how we can reduce um, emissions in public bodies. And uh, that's really where we've got to be focusing. Is the reporting as such the thing that changes people's behaviour in discussing that? Um, or are there other factors? But, um, you know, let's try and take that forward just now. Uh, and Mike Russell wants to make a specific I'd be point. particularly interested to just follow that up, convener. I, I, you know, I'm interested in Rebecca's remark that um, he, the, this reporting will prompt more climate change activity within the organisation. I'd be interested to know in specific ways that individuals within the organisation will be driven by the process of reporting to change. You know, it, this is a hearts and minds issue, but it's also a practical issue in terms of actions that individuals will take within the organisations, within universities, within the ambulance service, within the police. So I'd be interested in hearing that in the, in the, in the responses. Right. Um, we'll just add a wee addition to that so that you get a rounded picture. And that's this addi is an addition to what Mike Russell has yeah, said. Absolutely. Mike Russell's right in terms of changing behaviour within the organisations. But I wonder what impact these actions are having on changing the behaviour of your workforce as individuals. Because between you, you must employ a considerable number of people. And this committee is very much focused on behavioural change being behind what we need to do you know, to, to achieve what we're trying to do here as a country. So I just wonder if you're seeing any evidence of if you as an organisation are demonstrating how important this is, you're beginning to see your workforce as individuals out with the workplace changing their behaviour as well. So, Chris, would you...? Yeah, I think the reporting will help us to deliver more on the ground. I think bringing it to the attention of senior management of members, we have a very, very supportive members across all parties down in southwest Scotland. Um, so that works very effectively. There's some really challenging issues like adaptation in particular where the sort of decision cycle is going to be well out of political cycles. You know, these things are going to happen in 40 years, 30 years, 50 years that we need to take account of and start to plan for now. So that's going to be a challenge. But also in terms of what we do practically, yes, we run a cultural change programme. We have carbon champions. Um, we've got about 7,000 staff. We have a much, you know, over the last few years, the level of awareness with staff. We do a sort of annual survey just to see where we're up to and whether people are taking account of these things. Has We're running about 90-odd percent at the moment, which is fantastic. So it's much better than we originally anticipated. Um, in fact, I've had to change the metric slightly to maintain at that because we were getting nearly to the 100. Um, but... We still need to do work and actually identifying we're doing great on waste. We think we're doing pretty well on transport. We want to check the figures on that. Buildings, we're doing okay, but we need to do a lot more. And it's whether you go for the renewables as a solution. Do we go for techie fixes on boiler controls and that sort of thing? There's a, there's a wide range of ways. And actually trying to get our estate managers to focus on this sort of thing, so as opposed to maybe new build, is quite a challenge and it's trying to get it so embedded within the organisation that the individuals do remember the simple things like switching the lights off uh, makes a big difference but equally well you've got the your investment program looks at carbon this year we've done I think we've down about six and a half percent on our emissions on buildings some of that's down to we've lost about half a million off the budget as well which is fantastic um, but that's down to oil prices, I think, primarily. So that's had a really positive impact for us financially this year, but it's probably a, yeah, a short-term benefit. So it's trying to take account of all these sort of different factors coming in from a whole range of different sources and get it properly embedded within the organisation. Well. Can I just clarify a point? You talked about 7,000 employees. Are you talking yeah. about the Fries and Galloway yes. Council yeah. or the Sustainability Network? Because no, no, no. Over um, the network... This is, I'm, I'm using sort of work example. I'm energy manager and sustainability officer for Dumfries and Galloway Council. So yeah. use that as a day-to-day -day example. I think across the Sustainable Scotland network, you're probably talking hundreds of thousands of people, you know, sort of well into six figures um, with all the different authorities. Well, we'll develop that point with uh, Julie Robertson where there's quite a lot of these people and then David Seath. 
convener. Um, again, I would just raise the point about reporting and how it kind of keeps it very high in the agenda in terms of mitigation and adaptation. Um, throughout Glasgow City Council, carbon mitigation um, you know, has, has been a long established process and there's a lot of work being on, undergoing and um, currently undertaken in, in regards to that. Um, however, with regards to behaviour change in terms of staff, we actually have energy awareness officers and we have kind of ongoing campaigns about switching lights off and um, many different things that you can do in terms of reducing carbon. The importance that I feel that the reporting brings um, to that is obviously keeps it high in the agenda. In terms of adaptation, however, I do feel that it's lent us a lot of support in terms of taking part in innovative initiatives. Uh, so Glasgow City Council takes part um, and is actually actively um, involved in progressing a regional adaptation strategy and action plan uh, titled Climate Ready Clyde. Um, so the reporting really kind of gives us a bit of a, um, a push and it sort of influences um, the support for that kind of innovative action that's, that's kind of over and above maybe what would be within the realms of a city council. Again, um, as my colleague here mentioned, uh, sometimes it's sort of time scales. Obviously, climate change, you're looking way into the future, 30, 50, 80 years. Um, it, you know, political cycles and things, it's not necessarily um, easy to sort of combine the two. So again, it kind of lends support for those longer term initiatives. David Seath. Because to inform you about some of the things that we've been doing within the police service. Uh, there is a forum called the National Police Estates Group, uh, which represents all police forces throughout the United Kingdom. Um, and part of their work has been to produce an eco handbook, an eco handbook, beg your pardon, uh, which deals with environment impact. But this book, uh, booklet is aimed at all the staff. It's not just aimed at the management staff, it's for everybody. And it explains quite clearly what their contribution can be to improving the climate uh, of the organisation. It gives some practical tips about what they could do, some of the things that we've just heard about. Um, so we, we need to spread the message right throughout the organisation. It's not just for the people who are collecting data, analysing data, or, uh, producing information or reports. It's for everybody. Becca Bell and then Neil Deasley. Thanks. Um, I think there's two ways uh, in which reporting is likely to drive improved climate change activity. I think firstly there's the cliche that what gets measured gets managed and if this becomes a mandatory thing then um, and shining a light on what the organisations are doing in terms of climate change, I think that's likely to drive, sort of sharpen people's focus, maybe uh, particularly those of people who maybe don't see it as their job at the moment. Um, and for us at CLAX, looking at the, um, the reporting form, um, we're going to be reviewing our governance arrangements around climate change, which again I think will really sharpen up how we're doing and how it gets embedded throughout the organisation. Um, in terms of behaviour change, uh, the Sustainable Scotland Network has produced an e-learning module, which is a basic module available to the whole of the public sector. Um, it's aimed at all staff, not those whose job is climate change, looking at the duties, um, looking about the science around climate change, and then giving suggestions about what they could be doing in their day-to-day -day jobs to address it. Yes, uh, Grant Ferguson. <laughs> Bit about the reporting side. It's the detail that gives you the, the savings and the, the progress, which you can then use to motivate people to continue their contribution and to empower people, because that's the important thing, because the central control is what the techies do behind the scenes. It's the people that the day-to-day -day work, they have control over the lights, but also what they take home. And with the students, you know, that we've got the eco-schools projects coming through the primary secondary schools. The students come into the higher FE sector they then go into industry. Hopefully we can continue that cycle of learning and awareness and, and, and respect for the environment that they can take to their employer and they can contribute the wider ex the context and also the commute. That's the other thing we, we try to promote, the cycling. We're part of the, the, the cycling project within Edinburgh, the promoting public transport, getting people to, beyond our boundaries, do as much as they can. So it's a, <clears throat> as much a gain for us, reputational, we want to be seen and to do, we teach it, we want to do it, but also what contribution we have to the wider Edinburgh and, and um, agenda. So. so Neil Deasley. Um, 
Yeah, yeah I was just going to give a, 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 a practical example of, of, of how we translate the data into, into kind of uh, actions, if you like. And, and I wanted to use the, the ex example of, 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 of travel. Um, it's something that we measure very, very closely. We, 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 we pull an awful lot of, of information together each year um, to enable us to, to understand um, our transport and travel. And what that then enables us to do is to, we actually set targets most years for, for reducing uh, our transport and travel in particular sectors or, or in particular particular parts of the organization um, and what having the, the having that information uh, available to hand uh, and monitored every year allows us to set those targets and then to monitor those targets and also to put in place carrots and sticks um, in terms of for example carrots making sure that um, the right infrastructure is available to staff to do the right thing. Um, so by rolling out things like video conferencing and a software package that we use called Intercall that allows a kind of file sharing, a live file sharing across computers at the same time, um, allows people to, to do their business and to, and to, and to have, uh, uh, have meetings without actually needing to travel. So that's enabling, to do the right, enabling them to do the right thing, but also is much more convenient for staff. But also, the other way around, um, it enables us to identify where we actually need to be a little bit harder uh, and, to, and to actually... Um, prevent what we might call bad behavior. And a, a very good example of that is, is flights, where we actually actively manage them very, very closely now, um, to the point that they require uh, very senior managers uh, sign off to do so. And that's enabled us to, to drop by 95%. Uh, right, we've got three big transport users coming up just now. We've got uh, David Kylo, um, David Seath, and Jenny Neville to just comment on these bits, please. So, uh, Bruce, first of all. Delighted to hear everybody's trying to do their bit for transport. That's what SPT is all about, but trying to encourage people to use sustainable transport, active travel. And uh, we were delighted to have put uh, considerable resources into that over the last few years, and we're continuing to do so. Subway modernisation, the fast link bus scheme in Glasgow, anything that we can do uh, to support organisations um, in, in moving towards more sustainable travel, then we're delighted to do so. As I said earlier on, it's about reducing your carbon and also uh, saving money. And, and, and as we all know now, particularly with the active travel cycling, it's, it's good for you. Uh, and that was really just one of the points, just coming back to your, uh, your, your question. Um, and in terms of the reporting, I think it's important that organisers use it to reinforce the change. One of the things that we've found over uh, the last few years, as I'm sure others have, is it's very easy to do the low-hanging fruit. It's, it's when you get down to the ones which are harder to do. Um, you know, during the subway modernisation, uh, we're changing the lights, we're doing all sorts of... We're totally changing the way that we operate that system, and we're trying to embed um, environmental thought into that as we do it. And that's the tough bit, so if the reporting can, can assist with that, uh, we're fortunate in SPT that we've got very supportive uh, members, uh, very supportive senior uh, management who, who try to build this into how we go about our business. Um, so I think it's about reinforcing change. And just back to your point about, about the workforce, I think that any organisation that's serious about climate change should, should really start from the bottom up with their workforce. We did an initiative over the last year, uh, which we'd refreshed. We called it Make It Second Nature, which was really appealing to the workforce, not as just as employees of SPT, but also as individuals. Um, I think people are a lot more educated now about climate change and the effect it can have when you see the energy bills that come into your house. So they're more appreciative of that. But this was just to, again, reinforce perhaps what people were hearing when they were at home, uh, doing it in the office as well or in their, in their workplace, uh, and, and they would see the benefits both within the organisation. Um, you know, saving money, saving energy does uh, make, make more room for, for, for more jobs or more work, uh, but also they'll see a benefit in the house as well. Um, and David Seath and then Jenny Neville. Um, I'd like just to add a little bit to what I said before about who we require to educate here. One of the key things that we're saying to staff is, please take this home. Don't just stop it at the workplace. You can actually make a considerable improvement to Scotland as a whole by taking the same things that we're asking you to do at work to home and apply that in your, in your home environment. So that's one thing that we're uh, keen to emphasise. Uh, moving on to transport, we've roughly 3,500 vehicles uh, running about Scotland. Sometimes it's difficult to say to people when you've got to respond to an emergency, well, by the way, you've got climate change duties here, and uh, can you take your foot off the gas, please? Your driving style does not uh, suit. 
uh, that. So there's a conflict there in how we balance that. Uh, but there will be issues at times when we have got to respond to emergencies and climate change perhaps is a secondary consideration. However, that's the minority of uh, times that our vehicles are on the road. So we are educating drivers uh, about responsible driving when they are. We are introducing um, zero emission electric vehicles uh, where we can. And again, that has got to go further than just the workplace. We need to take it outside the workplace as well. True. I mean, we could uh, look at a lot of these things in a great detail, but I think at this stage, we, you know, we have to take it on, uh, you know, trust that we will be able to get more detail at some point in the future. But uh, Jenny Neville, your vehicles do have to travel fast. Um, on occasions, yes, they do. Um, we've done quite a lot of similar initiatives to, to the things that others have mentioned around um, estate adaptation, encouraging cycling schemes, video conferencing, all these kinds of things. But there is no doubt that the majority of our emissions are created by the vehicles that we have, which are responding to patient demand, whether that's accident and emergency demand or patient transport demand. Um, I think we've done quite a lot already in terms of trying to use energy efficient vehicles and moving towards Euro 6 compliant um, vehicles. But obviously there is a cycle time for doing that in that we obviously have to retain our vehicles for a period of time and so uh, that that's not something that we can do overnight. Um, I think the thing that will probably help us the most in terms of impacting on our emissions going forward is the, the work that the ambulance service is doing um, in terms of progressing its new corporate strategy, in, which is taking care to the patient in support of the government's 2020 vision. And if we can achieve that reduction in the amount of patients that we take to hospital, that should reduce our mileage and the associated carbon emissions, I would imagine. He wants to ask you a small supplementary. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. I'm aware that the um, Scottish Ambulance Service are in discussions with Scottish Fire and Rescue about co-location. I mean, obviously, finance is, is one of the drivers for that, but is carbon footprint part of that as well? Yes, I think that's certainly the case. And we have co-located in a number of places around Scotland, and we do actively look to continue that. But obviously, that can be a difficult thing to achieve as well, because people have established estate. They don't always have space. But certainly, where we're looking at new builds and things, there there is um, that type of opportunity, and we have taken that where possible. And not just co-locating with um, fire and rescue and the police, but also with other health service partners too, in terms of hospital co-locations and GP practices and things in certain parts of the country. Uh, Sarah Boy, I wanted to ask a supplementary. Brief supplementary on that, and it's partly for yourself, but presumably it applies around the table. The issue of procurement, um, where you're procuring goods or services or vehicles or energy equipment from out with the organisation. Um, the challenge of making sure that your staff know what they need to be procuring, but also whether the private sector who are offering kit for you to buy, they are beginning to meet those kind of climate targets or clear carbon reduction um, targets in terms of the type of services and goods that you're buying. Is that beginning to shift? Um, Yes, but I think it's probably slower than we would like it to be, and I think it can be difficult in terms of making sure that the staff have the skills to be able to assess the differences between goods and services that are being offered in a consistent way. I, I think there is a challenge there, and we've probably got more to do on that. Um, obviously, we use quite a lot of um, items that come from collaborative contracts, so we're then supported by the larger um, buying authorities that have more resources in these areas. And certainly where we're contracting on our own behalf, we are starting to put more um, evaluation criteria into the procurement processes that would pick up on these types of issues. So we're certainly addressing it, but I think there's, there's more to do. Uh, Claudia Beamish, just before I bring anyone else in on this, because I want to try and keep this rolling on to... Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of the mandatory reporting for um, those organisations that haven't commented on buildings, I, I note from the pie chart by source that 67% of emissions in the public sector come from buildings and it would be helpful if we could hear from you about how either the mandatory reporting will help with focusing minds or whether um, there's good practice at the moment. Just briefly, please. Yeah, um, it's, I was going to ask, is there anyone who's against mandatory reporting? That's good. I'm glad we've got that on the record. Um, and so, therefore, what you're doing about this very large chunk in the pie chart, the buildings. Anyone want a particular point there? Yes. 
I think it's well established. One of the best building rich organisations, I suppose, that there are. <laughs> yes. I think it's well established um, practices in place because it's, the, it's not the national uh, reporting that's driving that. It's what's happened over the last decade on building improvements, the technology changes, the carbon investment that we've, we've got. In the university, we've got a ring fence carbon investment fund that self feeds itself so that it pays for projects, the savings go back into the fund. That replicates or, or allows you to invest and we've been able to save 35 percent in our carbon um, emissions over the last five years so we've we've we're no different from anybody else we we've invested to save the bottom line improves in terms of finance the bottom line in, in terms of carbon improves so the established systems and that scope one scope two is the easier bit to record because everybody's doing that it's the scope three in procurement that's the difficult bit because that's where you get the 99% of the savings are in your, your buildings and your, in your, your infrastructure. The procurement is the more difficult bit. But I think the buildings is well established. Carbon man management plans that have been in existence for many, many, many moons now have driven that change. Detail on what you're going to do, when you're going to do it and what you're going to invest. And publicly having them available on the internet or inter internet sites. Good Seath and then uh, Neil Kitching. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, one of the key planks of our corporate strategy is to rationalise our estate. So we're evaluating all our properties right across Scotland. And one of the factors that we take into consideration is the carbon uh, production, the carbon emissions associated with that property. So that's a, a part of the evaluation. It's not the only criteria uh, which will decide whether we should uh, retain property or we should divest ourselves of that property, but it is an important one. So, And because it is such a large uh, contributor, as been, has been pointed out to our greenhouse gas emissions, we really need to uh, tackle that one first. We should get the biggest hits there. Uh, if I could come back to uh, carbon footprint from procurement, uh, we are aware that a model has been uh, developed for the police which will enable us to see exactly what our carbon footprint would be from procurement activities, depending on what you purchase, different factors, conversion factors for different commodities, whether it's ICT, whether it's uniform, it is possible to, to, to come up with a number which is represented, and it's quite a big number. <laughs> Confirmation. Right, um, uh, Neil Kitching. We lease nearly all of our office properties. Uh, most of these leases now are five-year periods. So when we looked at our property estate, uh, the first thing we did was upgraded all the lighting systems. So they tend to have very short paybacks of, say, 18 months to two years. So we can do that within a lease and financially benefit from it. Uh, the difficulty is, um, they're the easy ones, the difficulty things, thing is the things like boiler upgrades, which might be a seven-year, eight-year payback. External wall insulation might be 10, 15 year payback. There's no financial incentive or no financial case for us to upgrade our buildings within these parameters. And so that's a bit of a stumbling block for us. Okay, uh, Neil Deasley. Um, yeah, I'm just um, going to pick up on the point about rationalisation. And I, I think that's. Um, that there are real opportunities here, um, both for carbon savings and for and for financial savings. We we have been in a process of of, of rationalising our estate. We've moved from two buildings to one in Stirling, three to three to one in in Lanarkshire. Um, but the other point I wanted to make was about the opportunities for for co-location, for actually sharing buildings across the public sector. We've started to do that in a number of our buildings. In Aberdeen, uh, we share with SNH. In Stirling, we share with SNH. In Perth, we share with Scottish Government. Um, there are big opportunities to do more of that, uh, and the carbon savings and the financial savings uh, will flow from that. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we'll try to move into Jim Hume's question just now. Yes, uh, th thanks very much for thanks very much for that convener. We've, we've heard that I think Rebecca Bell said we need time and, and resources, and um, uh, Jenny Neville mentioned about uh, a way to go. So it'd be quite interesting to hear from some of the organisations how prepared they feel that their organisations are for, for the new mandatory reporting uh, measures, what steps they need to uh, be able to comply uh, with the proposed reporting requirements. Right. David Seath. At the moment, we don't, we don't do any mandatory reporting. There's no requirement for us to do uh, any uh, 
uh, such thing. So we're starting from zero base uh, on that, and it certainly uh, will involve us on a steep uh, climb uh, to make sure we've got resources in place to actually complete the, what the expectation is here. Uh, at the moment, I'm not sure that we have got sufficient resources uh, because we don't do anything at the moment. It's not part of our plan uh, to collect a whole series of data, uh, more than we've currently got. Um, so it, it's going to impact on us somewhere, but we've, we'll have to face up to that uh, and come up with a solution. And it may well be that the solution rise uh, in other uh, organisations a uh, contribution that they can help us uh, pull together and show us how things can be done simpler than maybe we anticipate it's going to be. Because uh, none of the uh, carbon uh, information that you get falls out of anything we currently are supplied with. You don't get how many tonnes of CO2 from your electricity bill. Um, you don't get it from anything else at all. <laughs> actually, someone's actually got to calculate something, do, do a thing. And it's not just about the analysis of the data, it's what information you take out of that. Uh, and the information part, I believe, of the report that's being proposed is key for me. Uh, it's what is, this, what is the message that we're trying to put out here and identifying what needs to be done in the future to make things even better than they are now. A supplementary on that point. Uh, yeah, thank you. I very much appreciate your, your candour, Mr Seath. But to be clear, was it the case that under the old police regime with the different forces that nothing was being done? Oh, no, that's not true. Uh, the only force that was caught by CRC was Strathclyde. Uh, however, when Strathclyde ceased to exist and Police Scotland came into effect, there's no requirement for us to record CRC. Not in this round. We will be caught in the next round, uh, effectively. So it will, it will eventually come to us, but right at this moment in time, it doesn't apply. So, Chris, would you... Um, yeah, we... I guess reasonably well prepared because we've been doing it on the local authority side. But the, I think the other thing from the SSM point of view, SSM have been involved in, through the climate change declaration reporting over a number of years, have been heavily involved in developing the mandatory reporting. So I think there is a resource there that will help organisations like Police Scotland. Um, you know, the fact that Police Scotland um, has gone separate has created us sort of work challenges because we're now having to disaggregate the Police Scotland and the Fire and Rescue Services from our existing carbon management plan, uh, but still recognise a lot of good work that went on in the past through both those services. So I think, yes, I think there's, there are resources out there that will help with the, the data collection, whether it's Resource Efficient Scotland, SSN, who are very involved in the helping the public sector across the piece um, to understand what the numbers mean. Um, we analyse the reports that are happening at the moment, so there will be a report out shortly looking at the last round of SCCD reports. I think other agencies do very similar things, so I think there is a resource out there to support that, um, and that's probably an area that needs to develop on further to make sure we're all sort of singing from the same song sheet and being fairly consistent in what we report. Um, Grant Ferguson and then uh, Rebecca Bell and Neil I think, Beasley. I think we're reasonably well placed to... Um, fill out the return. The, the only reservation is that we're lucky enough to have a resource within the university to do such a thing. We have an energy manager, we have a sustainability team that do because we're big enough we want to do it. The challenge will come more, I suspect, with organisations that don't, that this is the first time they've had to do it. We do monitor reporting, we do voluntary reporting, we're different. The other challenge we'll face is that we report on our financial academic years, which is different from this reporting period. We report from the 1st of August through the 1st, 31st of July on everything we do. So what we'll report as a sector on another, um, apart from CRC, um, we'll have one set of stats and then this will be another set of stats and they won't marry up because we're different reporting periods. So the colleges, universities will have and some of the organisations will have that challenge. But in terms of stats, I think the, a lot of what's there is, is available. Some more robust procurement still is the Achilles heel because the robustness of the data, we, we've gone through carbon masters, carbon standard, and externally validate on the, the electric and the gas use and, that, and the water uses is all easy stuff, but the, 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 the level of detail. So the, the other reservation is about the validation process. It's all about the validation process, what that means. Collecting it, but then the validation process could take as long as, if not longer. So 20 days could e easily become whatever it's going to be. And the last thing I'd like to say is it's important that we make sure 
from year one we set a standard because there's nothing worse than getting a mandatory report that then changes because you set yourself up for delivery and then things come in. It's, it has to evolve, I understand that. But when, when the goalposts move, there's nothing more galling than getting your systems ready and then the goalposts have shifted and you've, you've invested time that you could be doing other things with. So um, a few points there, but I think our, our university is well, well placed. So Rebecca Bell and then Neil Deasley. <clears throat> Um, I think Clap Manager Council is reasonably well geared up for the new reporting, although I think the, the new reporting format requires a bit more, quite a bit more detail than the climate change declaration reporting does. Um, I've been advised by my colleagues that I think most of that will be doable. Whether it will be possible to gather it together for this year or even next year is another matter, but I think it's something that we will be able to work out in time. The only thing that we don't that, that it looks like we're not going to be able to do is um, our waste arising. Uh, Clap Manager Council, as a, as a local authority, obviously collects waste across the area, and that's, that's what we measure, and that's what we report on to SEPA. So we don't measure our, our own estate waste arising, and I'm, I understand that there isn't the capacity or the resource to be able to do that any time in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so, OK, Neil Deasley and uh, Bruce Kylo. Um Yeah, just very quickly, thank you. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're quite lucky coming from, from having quite a mature reporting process. So, so hopefully um, our anticipation is that we will just need to reorientate what we do to fit um, the, the new requirements. Now, that will require us to do some things that we haven't already done. It will require us to do some things that we do do already in a different way. Um, and it will also have implications that we, we probably might need to, to reset some baselines for some of our targets because we, as we migrate into the, into the new system. But, but generally, uh, you know, we, we feel that we're able to... Um, you know, to, to, to take on board the new process and, and are prepared for it. I would absolutely echo the, the, the points that have already been made about the need for support and about sharing good practice, about sharing the learning and about sharing the journey, uh, really, for those of us that are all coming at this from, from, de from very different points along the journey. Um, so absolutely support and capacity building is key. Just to pick up very quickly on the point made about validation, we have externally validated each of our reports for the last um, 10 or 12 years or so. Uh, and the reason we do that is not just so that we're absolutely uh, on the money in terms of being robust and accurate, so we get a third party to come in and, and evaluate our, uh, the claims that we're making and the data that we present. We do that not just for accuracy and robustness, but also because actually it helps us to improve our process every year. Every time that review process happens, every time that validation happens, we get better because we get recommended recommendations from, from somebody looking at how we do it from a third party. And that over time gradually improves our process. So, so we do do it and we will um, continue to do it and fit it into the, um, into the new template process. So Bruce Kylo, are you getting better? Yeah, I think so. I hope so. Um, uh, one thing's for sure, we will be ready. Whatever the, 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 the government come out with, we'll obviously uh, <laughs> comply with that. I think the, the, the point that, that Grant made earlier, though, is that there are organisations where there are, they are smaller um, where it might be a bit more of a challenge and I think that's probably why it's important that in, in, in coming out with these formal reporting requirements that the Scottish Government issue very clear guidance. They're trying to keep it as simple as possible. They offer up training as much as they can and I think appreciate that over the first year or couple of years for some organisations uh, allow it to evolve. Um, and I think the, the, you know, it mentions in the, the regulations about penalties and things like that. I think there has to be a period to allow these things to bed in um, and allow organisations to uh, mainstream it within their organisation and see how that uh, um, settles down. But as I say, clear guidance from the government, uh, keeping it simple uh, and, and making sure that organisations like ourselves and others can build on what's already there. And more, the more similar to what was there previously, the, the better, I think. Okay, and Julie Robertson. Yeah. One resource. Uh, again, as I say, we've mandatory, um, voluntarily reported from 2008. Um, so the structure's there, it might need a, a slight bit of tweaking. Um, however, in terms of the validation and the proposal for validation, we do see that as a slight stumbling block, potentially in terms of additional resource, potential cost associations with it, um, where there's maybe not an identified budget. So we would pick up on that. Um, one of our recommendations was potentially to go down the line of a peer a review, um, potentially with maybe some of our higher further education than university establishments. Um, just picking up again on um, Bruce's point about guidance, I think, especially for organisations that haven't done it before, um, the guidance is really key. Uh, 
Um, I think we'll, J Jim, yeah, we, we, we'll just, just be quite interesting. <laughs> and we've heard from the police that it's starting from uh, zero, and we've heard from Glasgow City, uh, and they'll need resource, but Glasgow City, City, City Council have given a resource. I just wonder what kind of res resource that was, and was it the financial implications? Is, is it actual people, or is it just a change of culture that has actually happened within the organisation? Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, right, so Julie... Um, uh, I suppose it's a combination of things. I think there's, there's been a sort of a change in f uh, culture within the organisation, but um, particularly in terms of resource that may be needed for validation, I think um, yeah, t time resource and, and cost implications that may be associated with that. Um, a number of the data uh, streams that are collated within that are already validated, so uh, you know, it's maybe potentially a consideration of the usefulness of this sort of additional element of validation um, and potentially the sort of time it would take to go through this process um, for us to be ready for reporting on an annual basis. Good. I think that kind of uh, probably sums up quite a lot of people's uh, job uh, very well indeed. Um, can we move on to the next question, please, about training and so on and support to Angus yeah. McDonald? Thanks, convener. Um, it's, it's actually following on from Jim Hume's uh, original question and picking up on Bruce Kyler's point. Um, I'm just curious if the panel feel that uh, there's a need for support or training in your respective organisations uh, to allow you to comply with the uh, uh, re reporting requirement. Yes, David Seath. Agreed. I, there's absolutely no doubt uh, about that. Um, I couldn't sit here and commit to say we would successfully be able to complete report without that, starting from the position that we're currently in. Uh, I'm not saying that we've got zero uh, resource, uh, but we don't have a lot of resource. Uh, and certainly we want to be able to do it smart um, and in the most efficient manner possible. Uh, and we believe that that we could be facilitated through training. Um, so if there's any training out there, we would like to know where it is and how do we access it. OK, good point. And uh, Bruce Carroll. Just, just really picking up on, on something that Julie said. The other thing that I'd add in there is, is the expertise that's available out there. Um, there is a finite resource, pardon the, the pun, but a finite resource in terms of the expertise which organisations like ourselves or anybody else would, may choose to buy in. Um, and uh, if, if things do get too complicated, for example, in relation to any validation of our climate change reporting, so I think that's something, again, and obviously if that has to be done, then there's a resource implication for that if you're having to, to spend more money. I think the, the, when any kind of new piece of uh, mandatory reporting like this comes out, I think the training is, is, is essential, really, for, for, even for those organisations who feel that they're on the ball, um, because we want to make sure, I think the whole point of this is really to ensure consistency so that people can you know, look across different organisations and see, you know, compare like with like. And I think that will be really important in getting that message across. Again, from a resource point of view, that does um, uh, come in there. And I think that's something that, f for example, an organisation like ourselves, we would very closely monitor. Um, and I think so it might be the opportunity of the Scottish Government, uh, as, as these things come in, the mandatory reporting does come in, that the, the organisations such as ourselves and those around the table are given the opportunity to feed back on how it's going uh, beyond <laughs> what is just in the climate change reporting, but also resource, training, skills, expertise. Uh, those are the things that, 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 that I think should be monitored as well as just how we're, uh, how we're performing on the, the, the carbon reduction. Uh, so, Rebecca and then uh, Julie. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree that um, I think support and guidance is going to be key, really, for this, and particularly perhaps some guidance on, on standards of reporting. Um, sorry, I forgot the point I was going to make. might well just come to that point in a minute or two, but uh, fair dues, you know, uh, you're quite right. Guidance, do you think, is a key issue? Um, for organisations like local authorities that have been uh, reporting voluntarily for quite some years, Probably there's the value is in, is in the peer support, such as that offered by the Sustainable Scotland Network, whereas those who are starting from scratch on reporting are going to need much more tailored support and training. Um, and I think after um, the year of, of trialling the template and, and voluntary reporting using the new template, I think it will become clear where, where the most support is needed, and hopefully then that can be tailored. Uh, Julie Robertson. Thank you. I 
suppose, uh, from our point of view, the guidance would be essential really for, as a point of clarification on a number of uh, potential terminology or um, it, because of the slight changes, what to do if data isn't available, for, especially for the first round of reporting, um, just exactly what would be expected. Um, the other thing really to pick up on um, might not be essential for Glasgow City Council, but um, a note on a double potential double counting as well, um, when a lot more organisations are brought in, um, there's a potential for that sort of crossover and just making sure that everyone's um, kind of not reporting on each other's values. Very good. Um, Neil Deasley. Yeah, just, just to, to, to re-emphasise the, the, the point I made um, earlier on about the, the, there is a lot of expertise around the table and, and across the networks and, and, and bodies that we represent, and I think there, there is a genuine opportunity for us to, to work collaboratively together um, on the journey that we're about to, uh, to, to embark on uh, in mandatory reporting. I just want to pick up, just um, apologies, Bruce, just to pick up on one point that, that you mentioned there about um, that like that kind of like for like comparison, um, which I think. I think is actually going to be quite difficult and, and not necessarily, in, in my view anyway, desirable to be able to do because we're all public bodies with very different functions and duties and those functions and duties you know, have implications in terms of, on, in terms of our, our emissions. We also have different levels of control over how we can control those emissions. Uh, we're also very different size and, and geographically uh, located. And I think therefore that, that actually that, that desire for like for like reporting is, is, is one that that, that, that we would perhaps caution against that um, yes there is an opportunity for for I think benchmarking for, for particular types of authorities but but being able to you know compile a dreaded league table of performance I think would be something we would we would caution against um, I think yes uh, Neil Kitchen I to agree with what Neil was saying there um, every public body has their own unique circumstances so there'll be a temptation that somebody will go out and divide total emissions by number of employees um, well, that would create a very misleading picture. Um, so in our, in our response, we'll be suggesting that there's a new section in the guidance right up front, which enables you to briefly describe your organisational context. Uh, so in our case, we'd say we've got 1,000 employees. We have overseas offices through Scottish Development International. We have an industrial and commercial property estate. And um, we have a subsidiary, the Glasgow Science Centre. So the, the reader needs to know that before they then look at our results. Okay. Um, I think uh, what follows on from that is uh, what Claudia Beamish has just wanted to ask about. Thank you. Uh, it, it's the sort of challenging issue of sanctions or penalties or however you want to put it. And um, there's obviously an awareness around the table and beyond, beyond today that... Um, that organisations are at different stages along their journey. Uh, but I would value, the committee would value some comment on, on the, um, the need for these, the need for sanctions in the future, and if so, what a realistic, realistic timescale might be for that, the need or not for sanctions. <laughs> okay, anyone have uh, comments about that? It be sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Fair enough. Um, I'm not going to pick anyone at random. You have to come up with some answers yourself, Bruce Kyle. Well, well, I'll step in first. I think this is quite a challenging thing, as, 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 as you, I'm sure you understand. It comes back to what I was saying earlier. When, when mandatory reporting is introduced, I think from the government's point of view, there has to be an appreciation of, of how it evolves, allowing organisations to, to make changes within the organisation, particularly those, as, as people have said around the table, who perhaps haven't done this as, as, as in-depth as others before. So I think in you know, the first two or three years, perhaps, if there was a, 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 a more evolving approach taken to it, where uh, warnings or whatever were, were taken forward, and then as time moved on, I'm never one for advocating putting fines in place. I, I think it'd be uh, hung down and quartered when I went back to the office. But I think that that's something that if, if uh, it's like the, the carbon reduction commitment, it is a financial penalty, and it is one way of... Uh, getting the, the profile of what you're doing in climate change up the agenda within an organisation and before committees and uh, politicians. And I think that's when they see that it's in hard facts and figures, that's something that they've, uh, uh, very much gets their attention. So I think it's a, it has to be, by its very nature, an evolving process and something that is, is, is done proportionately over time. 
David Seath and Julie Robertson. Uh, thank you. Um, I think it's a very difficult area to, to go towards. Um, I can imagine uh, different scenarios whereby I didn't reach my target because of the degree days wasn't at the same figure as I had assumed when I made my calculation. The weather uh, can have a big play on us. A uh, hard winter can show, throw your figures all over the place. Uh, but because of that, I may have to suffer some sanction at some point in the future. So there could be a whole series of mitigating uh, factors causing you not to achieve maybe the target. Run. And, uh, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think it needs a lot of thought, careful thought about how you would do it. And I, I can't offer you a solution. I don't know what it should be. Uh, effectively, we're, we're already st strapped for cash uh, within the police service. And we can't afford to use any more, so we want to make sure that we did as best we could to uh, uh, meet uh, our obligations. Uh, I think the fact that uh, you would suffer reputational damage uh, if you are found to be wanting uh, would be quite a, um, a severe penalty uh, on its own. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to be named and shamed, uh, and that's about as far as I would be prepared to go at this moment. Julie Robertson. Yeah. Uh, really echoing what the, the other colleagues have said there. Um, definitely, I think, because we're all starting from a different baseline, I think really a sort of very um, sort of slow uh, progress into a level of compliance and a sort of tiered approach should be best taken. Um, initially, guidance and support for organisations that may be not meeting um, the demands of the reporting for whatever reason that may be. Um, some thoughts we'd had it was around maybe a compliance notice um, with maybe timescales or extended timescales for um, providing information um, and what the reasons why that would be essential. Um, and you know, again, echoing your comment there, the most severe sort of punitive measure that we would sort of suggest here was almost a name and shame. I think reputational, um, you know, damage is um, just as um, off-putting as anything else to, to make people comply. So that's why I would suggest that. So, uh, Neil Deasley. Um, uh, yeah, just just really to echo much of that, which I, uh, my view is that at, at, at the, particularly in the early years, we should support and, and not sanction, um, and, and getting those support networks in place to bring everybody al along on that journey to approximately the same place is, is where we need to focus our efforts, particularly in the early years. But clearly, on the back of that, um, it's useful to keep tabs and, and to keep reviewing the progress that we're making and, and what different public bodies are doing so that we can begin to identify where there may be um, issues that we need to tackle if, before, we, before we reach the, pro, uh, the uh, perhaps the concept of sanctions. So do you think a standardised form you know, is an important aspect of allowing this to happen? Does anyone would disagree that a standardised form is necessary in this case for us to achieve uh, you know, the, the progress we require. Chris, would you? You don't disagree at all. Um, but I think what is probably important is building some sort of review process, maybe on a three year cycle. Um, I think it was a, echo slightly a comment David made about degree days. I know for our consumptions, it goes up or down by 10%. You know, it was about 10 million kilowatts, depending on how the weather fits in. So that can actually throw things. So the, we maybe need to mediate things to recognise that. I think that's a lot of wise words there. Um, Sarah Boyack, your question. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, the guidance says um, specific public bodies which are to be included um, on the basis of influence or impact on climate change, and it sets out some clear criteria about those of you with large estates, large numbers of staff, high impact and influence, public bodies with large expenditure, and those that provide an auditory um, or regulatory function, is the list of bodies covered right? Are the criteria right? Any who's views? Who's first then? Yeah. Right, David Seath. Uh, no, we don't think it's uh, um, right. Um, if you look at the uh, Schedule 1 and the list of uh, bodies, uh, the police managed to appear twice. Uh, and it really, it's the same organisation uh, that's doing uh, the work. Uh, so although it says the chief constable or a chief constable, it also includes the Scottish Police Authority, and we think that's the same. So we, we don't think that Scottish Government are looking for two reports. We think that one report would suffice for the police service uh, within Scotland. It is a different 
thing for freedom of information, and I think that's probably where the list came from, uh, where the Chief Constable can have different uh, information than the authority would have access to. But that's not true for climate change uh, duties, and we think that that should be uh, revised to make it just the Scottish Police uh, Authority. We would have to produce that report on their behalf. Uh, they would scrutinise it and approve it uh, before it became into the public uh, domain. Um, so that's one area that we, we believe is, uh, um, is not right. I think, though, that the other the criteria for whether you're in or not uh, is valid, uh, and I think you've hit all the right buttons, uh, whereby any organisation that's there that does meet that criteria, does have that criteria, then should be uh, able to, or should make that contribution to submitting a report. Do you want to come back, Sarah, about any of that, or...? No. Any other answers to uh, the points that Sarah Boyack's made just now? I think they're all reasonably happy. The other thing is um, the issue about peer reporting, which is actually quite interesting in terms of how you might make that work with that big list of bodies. Um, those of you that are a small organisation, um, I think Scottish Enterprise, you made that point. There's not a lot of you. You have a huge impact versus local authorities. You have a huge staff complement. Um, but you've got a fixed financial envelope, that kind of compare and contrast, and maybe Scottish Government itself, how it plays into all this process as the setter of the rules, but also in terms of how it reports on its own performance. I think some interesting issues in there. Did anyone have any points on that just now? But, yes, Neil Deasley. Well, I think, correct me if I'm, I'm, wrong, I'm wrong, sir, but, uh, this comes back a little bit to the point about, um, about the, the validation process and... Uh, how, if that's something that, 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 that is designed to be pursued, how that might look like. And there are different ways of being able to do that. The, the, the approach that we've taken is to actually get an employer third party for a small number of days to come in and look at our data uh, and the way in which we analyse those data and, and the claims that we make on the back of them. That's, that's a relatively small piece of consultancy project. Um, but an, alter an alternative way to do it is exactly as you've just described there, which is to set up some sort of arrangement whereby public bodies are able to provide support and review processes that could contribute to that validation type process. And I think it's probably something that's, that's worthwhile exploring um, as, as, as a network of public bodies who are, who are going to be uh, doing, doing this, the, this work. So, so it certainly is a, is a way of being able to, to kind of bring some of that validation in without necessarily having some of the, the, the costs that you might, you might think are, 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 are built into that. Um, I was going to make another point about validation, but I'm sorry, it's gone completely from my head. It might come back to me. You're, you may think about it yet. Yes. Um, Graham Day? Uh, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Whilst accepting entirely the example David C. has given, um, isn't it really the case that no public body should be excluded? Nobody demurs there. That's good to know. We agree. Um, Grant Ferguson's the validation side of things, I think the peer-to-peer -peer review is the, the best way forward because otherwise all we're going to do is hand over money to externals who are going to see this as a, a cash cow at certain points of the year. So a few people are going to train up and doing it and at a certain pinch point they'll be charging all the public bodies and would that not be an egg on face with carbon reporting costing the government this or individual organisations? So uh, that, I think, needs to be carefully considered. Good point. And uh, Chris, would you... Just a point on the... Um, sorry, validation, <coughs> not the validation side of it. Your previous question? Sorry, um, I've got it all. <laughs> Basically, while we were talking, we, we agreed the standard reporting, but uh, Sarah Boy, that was about... The comment about should all public body agencies be involved... Maybe the answer is yes, but do we need to have a sort of almost like a dual scale yeah. reporting? Because it could be, you know, a doctor's surgery then becomes part of that reporting. So you need a, we may need to think about a light version if it extends beyond that existing 120, 130 organisations. If you've got anything new to add to this, fair enough. Uh, Neil Kitching. Um, just on validation, uh, whilst I'm not against the peer to peer reviews, um, I can just imagine it being quite complicated to set up and to make sure you do the peer-to-peer -peer review before the reporting deadline. 
Uh, an alternative that we are going to put in our submission is to do something similar to what uh, currently happens with the carbon reduction commitment, where you make your submission and then I believe SEPA do sample checks uh, after they've been submitted. So everybody's aware that they could be subject to sample check, and I think that keeps everybody on their toes. So Neil Deasley and then Rebecca. Yeah. Um, sorry, I've remembered what it was I was going to say. <laughs> sorry, I left, my, I left my brain somewhere else for a short while. But uh, uh, Which was, um, just going back to the, the points about peer-to-peer -peer review and potential validation, which was it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a, a validation process of the entirety of, of what's there. Actually, it, one of the things that we've done in the past is look at, at very specific areas, particularly around particular elements of data or particular ways in which we've interpreted elements and then reported elements of data. So you know, there may be a way of being able to do something which provides that um, security and robustness that validation or peer-to-peer -peer review provides, but is very much focused on one or two or three, you know, kind of key areas that, that, that we perhaps are able to agree on. So that's the point I was going to make and I didn't follow up. That's okay. So, Chris, and then Rebecca. In terms of the peer review, yes, in terms of CRC, yes, we, I think we had a SEPA review a few years ago, but we do actually bring in consultants to do that as well to just have a quick look over. And I think there is a risk of, well, we might have a challenge in finding the additional cash to, to do that. And I think the comment made that at the moment, there's nobody really in a position to do that. So it may be that we would, part of our review would be what we already do with CRC, but I don't think there is a, a body of people out there. So peer review, I think, potentially could be really, really a useful mechanism. I can think of a parallel where marine management plans are being developed in places like uh, Shetland first, and they're offering their services, you know, on a commercial basis. Um, there is opportunities for entrepreneurialism in public bodies here. Um, uh, Rebecca Bell. Uh, yeah, in terms of um, validation, whether it's internal or peer review, I don't think in our organisation there's currently the capacity or expertise to be able to do that, and I should imagine that's probably the same across the public sector. So I think if, if that's the route that the, the Scottish Parliament decides to go down, then I think there's going to be a real need for training and capacity building to support that. And Bruce Cairo, and then Sarah Boyack, come back. So, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Uh, I think the, the, the point about SEPA and the, the CRC is, is correct, but I think SEPA themselves would struggle with the, the range of organisations that are going to be suddenly put uh, under, their, uh, under the reporting arrangements to, to be able to do that in any meaningful way. For me, the peer-to-peer -peer review will accept that there might be challenges in, in doing that for organisations. The sharing of best practice, I think, is absolutely vital in building up the expertise in that area, building up the expertise within public sector organisations for those who perhaps aren't, who, who don't have the, the, the luxury of a dedicated team to look after it. I think that is hugely important um, because, as otherwise, I think, as, as Grant said, there will be a series of consultants out there who will make a fortune every year off the public sector, and that is not something that we would like to see happen. We want to make sure we are spending our money wisely and we are sharing that best practice, building the expertise so that we can uh, uh, take care of it ourselves. It becomes mainstreamed within our organisations. All right. And Sarah Boyack, too. It, it just finally, I think it is a really um, important discussion to have about um, raising the standard of knowledge in all the organisations, but also having something that is capable of being properly interrogated and something, regardless of whether there's a sanctions regime, that actually stands up to public scrutiny or independent <coughs> scrutiny. So I think your views and feedback is actually quite important in terms of thinking it's not just who's on the list, but the different challenge for different people on the list. I think some fine detailed thoughts about how that works in practice, but also generally across the public sector, I think would be useful to us um, in terms of our scrutiny of the process, but also to the Scottish Government in terms of designing a scheme that's going to be fit for purpose. I'm assuming that this is going to allow all these organisations to be even more granular about what they tell uh, the government in their submissions. Yeah. OK. Um, Dave Thompson, uh, another point, please, perhaps to... to yeah, thank you very much, convener. It, it, it kind of follows on in a sense from, from that discussion. It's about the timescales for reporting. I noticed that there was a, a suggestion that uh, in the first year uh, it should be pushed back to November rather than uh, October. Um, and, of course, uh, in following years it would be within six months, so it should be the end of September. I just wondered 
um, why, you know, what the reasoning behind pushing it back to the end of November rather than October was in the first year. Um, obviously, folk will be learning the ropes. Uh, and whether the uh, six months, you know, uh, and following years was uh, a sensible timescale for reporting. So, who wants to kick off? Chris would you? That was certainly one of the views that came out of the consultation that SSN ran, um, about 41 different organisations. Um, and generally, there was a view that it should be pushed back. Partly, um, CRC reporting, the deadline for that is 29th of July. So we're not going to have the necessarily accurate CRC data for those organisations who were involved in CRC before that time. But the second side of that was the committee cycle to get back up to, for our cases, our local authority committees. It takes probably six weeks, a couple of months to get a report through. So end of July, end of September, October is quite tight because we will still have to pull the, the data together to get that beyond what we get with CRC. So I think the view was, yes, in theory, it'd be nice to do it by October, but in practice, just because of the committee cycles, it might be quite a challenge to do that. So I'm not sure whether the, the November and October the following year, I think it was maybe November would be a better deadline across the, the piece just to account for that sort of the time it takes to get that together and get it, at, you know, agreed by your committees or whoever's looking at it. Uh, and would that be November rolling on? You yes, know, I would um, have thought so, yes. Um, right, uh, unless it changed CRC, but that'll be challenging because we've got financial year end and all the other steps before you can get to that point. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have the problem of getting your peer reviews squeezed in as well. You know, yeah, it's... or, uh, you know, CRC, I don't, I think we put the CRC report up and then, get, then we get the review done there, you know, sort of, we look, don't necessarily look at that in advance or we don't get the report back in advance. Um, but it is a challenge. Anyone else point on that, this question of timing and so on? Uh, yes, Neil Deasley. Just, just as a quick reflection, um, uh, in all the years that we've been voluntarily reporting, uh, I, I don't think we've met September 1, actually, so it's always been October or November time. So, so um, that probably is a fair... Uh, a fair comment that, that, that September is possibly a little bit tight. Okay, you get a star for reporting every year. Um, and thank you uh, for that. I think uh, we've covered quite a big uh, scalp of ground here. Um, I'd like to thank all of you as witnesses. It gives us a chance to make our report to the Minister, I'm sure in due course, about what we think uh, they should note. Um, your uh, views have been very valuable indeed. And I'd like to thank you all for taking part in this. As agreed at previous meetings, the committee will now move into private session to consider draft letters on the review of agricultural holdings legislation, final report, and the Scottish Government's biodiversity strategy. And at the next meeting of the committee on the 6th of May, <coughs> we will consider the draft Climate Change Additional Greenhouse Gas Scotland Order 2015 as well as returning to correspondence on biodiversity strategy and the committee's work programme. So I now close the public part of this meeting and ask the public gallery to be cleared quickly. <laughs>